My guest this week is a good friend of mine, and it's Dr. Patrick White. He has a degree in Ecological Studies from Edinburgh University and a PhD in Agroecology from Reading University. His current role is as a lecturer in Environmental Biology at Edinburgh Napier University. Patrick, welcome to STEM with Mr. N. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. You're very welcome, and thank you for giving up your time to be here. So let's start off with what does your role as a lecturer in environmental biology actually involve on a day-to-day -day basis? It's a very varied role, actually. Um, as a lecturer, you, you are a form of teacher, you know, in the same way you'll have teachers at, at primary or secondary school. So one of your jobs is, is teaching people a particular topic at a university when you're a lecturer. Um, but the other main part of your role as a lecturer often is actually also doing um, in novel research in the subject that you're teaching. So the idea is as well as teaching what's already known about a topic, um, is also doing novel research and finding out new things about that topic. And ideally, there's an opportunity as a lecturer to integrate those two things together. So to if you can to find out new things and then teach those and, and teach how those new things fit into what we already know um, about a topic. Um, and it is, a, it is a very, very varied role. Um, just even over the last couple of days, um, I've been doing a few of the things that I often do um, in my job. Yesterday, I was out in, in, in the field with um, one of my master's students setting up a new study site. Um, where we were studying um, a, a, a set of a badger, um, a badger clan, and we were putting remote cameras out on the set. So that's an example of something I do, work with student projects. Um, today I'd be marking students' work and feeding back on their work. Um, these are projects that students have done where they've done their own mini research project, and my job is to um, feed back on that and tell them what was good about it what they could improve in the future. Um, and I've also been doing things that come from my research side of my role. So for example, today I've been um, preparing a scientific paper that comes from um, a study I've been doing. And it's important that we write up our science into scientific papers um, so that um, the work can, can be made public and other scientists can build on that work or um, improve it or disagree with it or apply it to conservation, for example. Um, so it's a real mix of, of different roles uh, that I do as a lecturer. And there's a really good link there with what you said about having to write up your papers and have them published so that other people can see it. And it shows that STEM isn't just a, a standalone, that it does connect to other curricular areas like the literacy. And you'd said there about being involved in student research projects and also your own research projects. Are you more weighted in one direction? Do you end up in your role doing more student research projects in the field or do you tend to get students more involved in the research that you're doing? Yeah, that's a, that's a really, really good question. So it, it's, it's a bit of a balance um, and it can, it can depend on, on, on the interests of the students. But Often there is actually an opportunity to get students involved in your own research. So, um, for example, over the last few years, I've been doing a, um, a research project looking at um, how can we use remote cameras to study otters, um, which are quite secretive nocturnal animals that we don't really see much of. So we can use secret remote cameras to study their, their biology. Um, and so there's an opportunity there to work with students, um, PhD students, master's students, undergraduate students, and they can do smaller projects within a larger research project to help you answer little questions. Um, or um, one student might collect data on one topic in one year, and then you can get another student the following year to collect similar data. And there may be another student to collect data another year. Um, each of them gets their own interesting project from that sequence and then you um, as as a researcher can then compile those data together and maybe find out more than each of the individual students was able to do by looking at patterns across multiple years or multiple sites or multiple seasons so 
they can work quite nicely together, your own research and students' research. And, it, and I think it's good sometimes, it's a good experience for a university student to actually do a piece of research that contributes to a, a bigger project. And um, having said that, sometimes our students will do their own project because they have a specific interest, maybe in, I don't know, bats or plants or um, some other kind of species or environment or system. Um, they're interested in studying that and they can do their own standalone research project as well. Um, so there's a lot of collaboration that, that goes on there. And in the very first interview that I did as part of this series, the guest for that didn't have much English when he moved to America and the collaboration in STEM helped him through education. Do you all have had a different journey from him? But I'm going to take you all the way back. Where did your interest in STEM come from? I think it came from, my interest in science came from school. Um, and interestingly, it came from, I think, from geography. Um, geography is sometimes, at, at school, geography is sometimes put in with history um, as, a, as a humanity. But my geography teacher, uh, Mr. Lyon, he was always talking about how he felt geography was a science because we used, in geography, we used the scientific method where we went out and observed the world and we made hypotheses about the world and then we collected data and observations to try and test those hypotheses and, and, and our knowledge advanced in that way. So I think my interest in studying the natural world as a science um, really started in school and, and that's what inspired me. Um, and I, I was going to study geography at university, but um, I discovered this subject called ecology, which I then went on to pursue. Um, I discovered this subject ecology and uh, actually changed my mind about my university course. And ecology and geography are similar in the sense they're both they're both sciences where where we study um, the natural world. But ecology has much more of a focus on the on the wildlife, the plants, the animals, and how they interact with their environment. Whereas physical geography is more about the environment itself. Um, so I kind of moved in that direction um, for university. So you'd said in there that Mr. Lyons was obviously an inspiration when you were studying geography and wanted to do that at university before you discovered ecology. Did you discover any ecology inspirations from any people uh, that led you further in that direction? Yes, I, I think one, you know, one specific memory I had is I, when I was in the first year of university, I, and I'd chosen to study ecology. And I suppose I didn't know the full extent of ecology because it, it wasn't a subject of school. We didn't have an ecology class that was timetabled. And um, I decided to study ecology because I was interested in wildlife and the environment. But I didn't really know about everything ecology involved as a, as a science. But I picked up a book called Running with the Fox, which was written by um, a famous mammal biologist called David MacDonald, who is a, a professor at Oxford University. And this documented his journey in STEM um, through his degree, his PhD and his early research work. And as the name suggests, running with the fox, he, his research was, he was interested in the biology of foxes. Um, and he did some early pioneering work about studying their movements and their home range behavior, their territories. Um, and he used interesting technologies that at the time were groundbreaking, for example, fitting um, trackers to foxes so he could study their movements, behavior, how they interacted with their environment and with other foxes and other species. So I think that was really inspirational to me and made me think that it would be interesting to, to then not specifically foxes, but to be able to study different species in detail and find out more about how they lived and how we can protect them and conserve them. And when you were moving into ecology, were you aware of the fact that you could actually then spend your life as a career studying the environment or did you go in that route purely out of interest and didn't realise the career opportunities that would be available? Yes, I, yeah, I very much followed my interests. Um, I, I, I wasn't really thinking forward to 
to careers. Um, I think it can be a good idea to look at what careers are available and, and see if if, um, if there's something you think I'd love to do that and then you can try and plot a route towards that. But equally, it's possible instead to just follow your interests. So do a, do a subject you're interested in in school and maybe in university. And so I chose a subject I was interested in. I didn't really know what careers are available in ecology um, after uni. And it turns out they're very diverse. It's not like it, often if you study medicine, you become a doctor. Um, there's actually lots of different roles that you can go into. Mine is just one of those roles. Um, so no, I didn't know, and I just followed that interest, um, uh, for, you know, into university and beyond. Um, and I think it was really only when I, um, I think it was only when I started, I, when I was looking for a job as a lecturer that I actually kind of planned uh, that as a, as a career step, because I thought it would be a good opportunity to, to do that research I talked about earlier, but also to do the teaching and teach students, which is another part of my job I really enjoy. You said about planning that route into being a lecturer. Were you involved in any ecological jobs prior to moving into um, being a lecturer? Yes, I was. Um, th th there's often a there, there is often a, a career path that leads into being a lecturer, um, which involves um, after university doing a PhD. Um, it is possible to be a lecturer without a PhD, but it's quite common to have a PhD. And a PhD is where you spend usually three or four years doing a, a piece of work on one particular topic, but, but studying it in a lot of depth. Um, and it really teaches you the skills you need to be a scientist. Um, if you do a STEM PhD, the skills you'll, you'll need, the research skills, the data analysis skills, the writing skills. But it's it's not that common to do a PhD and then straight go straight into lecturing. What's what often people do is they do some kind of scientific job in between, and that's sometimes called a postdoc, it means post after doc after your doctorate. And I did a postdoc um, up in uh, the Highlands of Scotland, um, and similar to a PhD, it was a it was a, a three year job where I focused on one specific piece of re research primarily. Um, which involved studying um, an, an endangered species called the black grouse. And so I spent three years trying to understand better the ecology of the black grouse in the highlands so that we could um, know more about how to protect the species um, and manage the, the landscape for the species. So you've obviously then been involved in ecology and the environmental studies for a wee while now. How has the role changed since or that area of study change since you first got involved in it to um, where you are now? I think one of the biggest, I think one of the biggest changes in, in ecology, so the study of, of animals and how they interact with their environment is the increasing use of technologies. Um, you know, it, I think when ecology was a, a young science, a lot of it involved going out and making direct observations. Um, going out and studying plants and animals um, and, and looking at behaviours of species. Um, and that still plays an important role. But what ecologists have also done is, is, is use technology to improve the way we can study um, um, animals, plants and their environment. Um, and, and those technologies, that, like in any, in any subject, those technologies advance really rapidly and, and, they, and um, you know, it can be difficult sometimes to keep up with, with the technologies they've moved so fast. But just a few examples, um, we use in ecology, we use a lot of um, uh, tracking devices where we can, um, we can put a, a transmitter or a tracker onto an animal. Um, uh, and, and that could be an animal as big as a, a polar bear or an elephant or as small as a, a bumblebee. We can put trackers on, different types of trackers on now. And, um, the technology for that has really changed, even in the even in the last ten years. Um, you know, we can use satellite GPS tags, and we can really actually follow almost in real time the movements of um, individuals of a specific species. Um, another example is um, the use of drones. Um, 
where we can you know do surveys or um uh, take pictures or monitor really remote areas um, or much larger areas than we'd be able to um, without that use of that technology. So that's really, really important. And um, the use of DNA in conservation, use of DNA technology in conservation has really advanced as well. People are developing technologies now where you can, for example, take a sample of water and, and, and mud from a pond and actually get an idea of which species of invertebrate fish um, uh, amphibians are actually using that pond because although we have dna inside of us we're also always constantly shedding dna through skin through um, uh, through other ways into the environment um, so these technologies are really exciting and they help us to know more information about more hidden parts of animals um, uh animals uh, lives and um interactions um but we need to just make sure that we use them well and use them correctly and the data we get from them is, is of good quality so as you said their technology is obviously advancing really rapidly and your focus through your um current work and your previous studies was on ecology so how much do you need to link in with people in other stem fields such as people who are um, up to speed and proficient with flying drones or using the DNA sequencing technology? Is there a lot of collaboration involved in your research? Yes, there is a lot of collaboration in, in my research, but more, much more broadly. Um, I, I, I was just emailing with an electrical engineer this morning, actually, because I'm one of the projects I'm working on at the moment is using uh, camera traps. Some of your some of your uh, viewers may have seen these camera traps that you can buy where they're, they're often called stealth cameras or trail cameras and you can put them out in the woods or in your garden and they can record at night so they can get an idea of what's using your garden what's using a feeding site what's out in the woods and but that uses a uh, you know that uses technology it uses um wireless technology it uses um uh, electronics and stuff like that so um I was speaking to an electrical engineer this morning about possibly developing a project together um, relating to these stealth cameras. Um, the other, I suppose one of the other areas that um, ecology has developed links with, links with over um, the years is, is with data scientists, um, because we live in, the, we often live, we often call it that we're in the era, the era of big data all these new technologies are great but they produce a lot of data so we can produce a lot of scientific data but lots of data means the need for lots of analysis and lots of technique for analysis so i think that's the other areas where i've seen linkages is is, is with data scientists or computer coders um, and actually very often these days ecologists need to have some knowledge of computer coding and data analysis um, it's a really really important part of the job um, as well, as well as the field skills and the interest in the natural world. So we're talking there about how technology has changed the way the role works. Are ecologists noticing any changes as well involved in the research to do with climate change? Is that having an impact on any ecological observations? Yeah, I think it's having a, I think it's having a huge impact and, and there's very few areas of ecology where, where climate isn't some kind of, of, of factor. I think probably one of the areas um, that, it, that it's most noticeable is in, in, in the field of conservation ecology. So conservation ecology or conservation biology is where we, we, use, we use our knowledge of ecology and the environment to try and understand why species are in, endangered um, and, and to try and help to develop strategies to conserve species or habitats or ecosystems. And I think traditionally the sorts of problems that cause extinctions or cause species to decline or become endangered were things like, you know, exploitation, so people hunting um, or overfishing, habitat destruction, um, invasive species and things like that. So those kind of problems and um, a lot of effort has gone into learning how to tackle those kind of threats, but laid on top of that now, 
um, we have this issue of climate change. And one of the problems with climate change is that um, even if you have a protected environment that is protected from exploitation or habitat destruction or invasive species, although that's very, very difficult to do, even with all those things tackled, climate change is still changing potentially the environment um, and changing the environment experienced by ecological communities, populations, etc. So it's a, it's a very, very difficult area to, um, uh, to work in. And I think there's been quite a lot of uh, research that's been done recently about how can we make habitats populations ecosystems more resilient to climate change so accepting that there is we've already humans have already um impacted sort of you know um global chemical cycles that in such a way that even if we even if we stop now you know emitting greenhouse gases for example we would still experience climate change decades and decades into the future and so we need to find ways to um to allow species to not go extinct um, in the face of climate change. And that, that's quite a big area of research. And what I also took from that answer is there's still a lot of work and a lot of research to be done going ahead as these changes continue to develop. As you said there, even if we stop now, there's still going to be changes. So there's a lot of scope for children and young people listening who are interested in ecology to actually be involved in that research in the future. But is there anything that children and young people can do now if they are interested in uh, studying animals that can get them sort of started on that journey? Yeah, I would say probably probably the biggest thing is, is, to, is to get out and do some, get, get involved, do some voluntary work do some voluntary survey work or some voluntary practical conservation work. Um, one of the one of the one of the important things um, in our discipline of ecology, conservation science, are our field skills and the ability to um, identify species, different plants, different animals, how to survey them, um, to be able to identify different habitats and therefore know the problems that different habitats face. Um, and also gain practical skills like, you know, how to use, sounds simple, but how to use binoculars, how to use a telescope, how to survey ponds for amphibians, um, uh, or how to survey grasslands for butterflies and, and all these things. And actually, a lot of these skills, although you might learn them um, in, in, your, in your job or in a degree at university, a lot of these skills can also be learned through, through volunteering. Um, and there's loads of opportunities for volunteering, um, you know, in the UK and abroad. Um, for example, you know, there's some really, there's some great wildlife charities like the RSPB um, or the Wildlife Trusts, which in Scotland we have the Scottish Wildlife Trust, or if you're in England, each, most counties have their own wildlife trust. They have volunteer days or they have um, family days or days where you can come along and have a guided walk through a specific habitat or, um, or reserve. Um, there are conservation volunteer groups where you can go out for the day and help to uh, remove an invasive plant species that's choking, uh, choking a particular habitat. Um, or you can go and help to do some practical work like thinning of trees or hedge laying or all these kind of different skills that are needed within um, conservation. So I'd probably say the number one advice is, is, is get out and get involved, um, you know, and do some volunteering. And that's also quite important in terms of, of STEM career, uh, in terms of, of, of careers in ecology as well, because, um, because there are these opportunities to do volunteering and build these additional skills on top of your academic skills. And when people are applying for their first jobs in this field, often those volunteering um, experiences can help to um, make your CV stand out, make your application stand out as well. I think that was a, a very detailed answer there about all the things that children and young people can get out and do. And it's been a very interesting interview. I've learned lots of different things about ecology through it, and I'm sure the people that are watching will have as well. 
So uh, Patrick, thank you very much for uh, giving up some time to speak with me today. It's, it's been very interesting. So thank you very much. No problem at all. Thank you very much.